Amy, you've come to listen to. So I just wanted to say welcome everybody to Jamyang Leeds and welcome to this session. Uh, thank you to uh, Ven Miller for uh, doing it on Zoom. Due yeah, to, just uh, Amy. You can call me Amy. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Amy, for uh, switching to Zoom uh, because of well the rail strike amongst other things. And um, I think most people are already uh, familiar with you and your teachings. So I'm going to mute, uh, continue accepting people and uh, leave you to start the session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much to Jamyang Leeds and um, everybody that's been um, part of helping uh, to um, host these teachings. Thank you so much. And thank you to all of you for coming. And you look like you're well versed, like you're in a meditation um, session. So thank you so much. Sometimes we have to talk about a little bit of the Zoom etiquette, as you know, because we found people um, during Zoom, you know, having dinner, drinking wine, and during the teachings, lying down in bed. So we, some of the centers have to say, pretend that you are in the meditation hall. So thanks so much. And um, because it's a teaching, if you're able to put your camera on, Thank you for doing that because um, you do feel the energy. You know, it's nice to actually have people here. When I lead retreats, I don't care if people have the camera on because they want to meditate, um, but it's nice to see your faces. Thank you. So let's put ourselves in the right space and thinking about a little bit of stillness to start and then setting a good motivation. So I really like to start in that way. So just find a comfortable posture where your back, your spine can be as extended as possible. As Lama Zoparimshe says, as if your sides are long. Can lightly close your eyes. And so if one of you is able to catch anybody that's trying to get in, thank you. As you lightly close your eyes, let go of the external distractions. Begin to deepen your respiration. And as you do this, begin to notice any tension you might be holding in your body right now. So you could even scan for a couple of minutes from the top of your head all the way down and out your feet. Just noting where you might be holding tension and use your breath. So use an inhalation to open up space in any of those tense areas. And upon an exhalation, allowing that tension to release as much as possible. You can absolutely meditate sitting in a chair. Just make sure, make sure your feet are straight down flat on the floor, not crossed. Or you may be seated on a cushion with cross legs, that's fine. Whatever best supports that expansion, the extension of the spine, as if your back is straight. And if you have your feet on the floor, or even if you're seated on a cushion, Feel the grounding right now with our planet. 
Mother Earth is always there beneath us, no matter how challenged. You feel the roots coming from the earth, coming through you, feet all the way up through your body, not holding you, not in a leaden way, supporting you in a supportive way, always there. Just feel the grounding for a moment. As you breathe in and breathe out. So think about all the distractions of your day and all the distractions of that external reality we live in and how often it sets our mind off balance. So some of you have meditation practices for years. Some of you are newer. But it's wonderful to return our awareness, to return ourselves, if we can, once a day at least, to some form of stillness. You simply are breathing in and breathing out and not worried about meditating. Not worried, am I meditating? Is the meditation going well? I'm a lousy meditator. Whatever that inner monologue is you let that go let those bubbles of thoughts float off see them float off into the air whatever ruminating story you have from the day or the week and just allow yourself for a moment to be in meditation to simply be So the space is always available for you. And once we start to gain some familiarity with this space, then we can learn other meditations, techniques that help us meditate better as we construct a rich, consistent practice for ourselves. Keeps you buoyant. It is your safe cushion, your safety net in a sense. It's always a place to return to, to come there, to be in being with through all the challenges life is throwing at us. That's your safe space. And from here, let's just take a moment to relish the positive circumstances of, of our lives, our privilege. Just drink that in for a moment, feeling that gratitude seeping through body and mind.
And let's think about death and impermanence, how quickly this advantageous position is passing away. So not to frighten you, but to balance you, to think let's make meaning right now. We still have the remainder of the day. We have some time together this evening and tomorrow. So let's derive some meaning, as much meaning as possible. Let's layer that into our minds planting those seeds of deep virtue, hopefully, but to propel us along a path to full awakening, to get us fully enlightened. Why do we want to become a Buddha, a fully enlightened being? The real purpose in this tradition is to benefit all living beings, to perfectly serve all beings. So if you like that idea, you like that motivation, feel free to include it in your motivation right now, taking a moment to set, this is you directing your mind in a most positive way for our time together this evening and all the activities of the rest of your day. So please set a good motivation. I'm thinking about refuge, refuge and bodhicitta. So the four line refuge prayer, I'm gonna share my screen in a moment. We'll just recite this, but let's think about what we're actually saying. The entire path is contained in those four lines. So again, we refuge is safe protection, is protection from more suffering. I don't wanna suffer, so I need to find shelter. And in this tradition, we take shelter in the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. So the omniscient mind, because if your mind knows everything, you're free of all fear. You can perfectly manifest every moment. The Dharma, which are ultimately the teachings on emptiness and the philosophy overall. The Sangha, the spiritual community, like a center in leads, and ultimately those who've had a direct perception of emptiness. So this is, in a sense, that the three jewels are this community that helps support us and show us how they've done it, the teachings of what they're studying, what they're transcending, and then the Buddha overall, this omniscient consciousness that is manifest in Shakyamuni Buddha and many other highly realized beings. So again, you check up slowly is that a shelter? Is that a, an appropriate shelter, appropriate refuge? So we, we take refuge in them. Why? Um, through, through the merit I get from listening to teachings, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take that merit, invest it in so I can become a Buddha to benefit all, all living beings. So let me find these, this prayer. Let's see, where did it go? I lost it. Okay, let me see if I can find it again. Here we go. I don't think you can see that yet. Oh, yeah, there we go. Sorry, it doesn't seem to be having a few obstacles here. Let me shut that off. Can't seem to get it. Okay.
Okay, can you see that? Okay. Great. So we're going to recite once in English and twice in the phonetics. Um, again, really thinking about the meaning, the words that you're saying. You can imagine the Buddha or any particular teachers you have in the space in front as we recite this prayer. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By the merits I create through listening to the Dharma, may I become a Buddha in order to benefit all sentient beings. Chanchu bardu dagni gyabzuchi, dagi chin ningi peso namgi, dro la penchur sange dru parjo. So I'd imagine some of you or most of you have had teachings on karma before. Um, but it's always a great reminder. Some of you may be brand new, so no problem at all. So we're going to go through what we can understand about karma. And karma is the um, one area in the overall philosophy that will involve more faith. So it's not something we can prove to you. And that makes it a little harder, especially when we're newer in the Dharma. We've heard the word karma. We hear it, it's now entered normal English language. I've heard it in commercial advertising in the United States. And, uh, but people don't actually understand what it means. So it is a Sanskrit term to start with. It's a Sanskrit term that actually means action. So it's action, it's the movement of your mind, the movement of your mind. And according to Tibetan Buddhism, as many of you, as many of you know, there's no beginning or end to our minds. So there's, which indicates past lives and reincarnation. So let me talk about the mind for a little bit, just so we can understand. The mind is seen as a continuum, a stream of thoughts, ideas, memories, feelings, um, different types of awarenesses like that. And when we talk about mind in Tibetan Buddhism, we're not talking about something physical like the brain. We're talking about consciousness. That's a, a, a term that's synonymous with mind, mind or consciousness. You learn a lot about a certain methodology or religion based also on the language. So for instance, it, if you know in North America and you've heard of Eskimos, they have many, many words for snow so it gives you an idea they must live around snow. They must live in a cold place with a lot of snow. So Tibetan system, many, many words for mind, many words for mind, because Tibetan Buddhism is a work of, of shifting your mind, creating a, a um, discipline for you to eradicate permanently all the negative aspects all the negative tendencies and habits that don't benefit and for you to enhance all the natural positive qualities of your mind. And that's a lot of what we're doing in here. One of the most important parts is that we get the right view as we're doing it and have an understanding of emptiness. Um, but what I was talking about earlier was first in this, in the little bit of meditative session set segment we were doing is we have, um, this uh, precious human rebirth. So when I said reflect on the positive qualities and circumstances of your life, the life of privilege, which we all have, just the fact that we can be on a Zoom call, a Zoom class together, says we have electricity, we have technological devices, we have internet. So I think that's a pretty privileged place to be like that with assuming food, clothing and shelter. So you can reflect on many, you know, ad advantages of a, of a human life. And traditionally, there's 18 situations of 10 freedoms, eight 
uh, eight freedoms, 10 richnesses that make up technically what's called a precious human rebirth. This is kind of the beginning of the Lamrim of our philosophy. And then what you do is you move in from that you need to have a healthy basis to start from. So I love that the Lamrim starts with precious human rebirth because so many of us are crippled with low self-esteem, being incredibly self-critical and negative like that, especially Westerners. So right away, they just take that and say, can you please reflect on, you know, and I, I love to have gratitude just streaming through my day. I wake up with it in the morning as much as I can wake up with gratitude in the morning, like a, just a two minute practice lying in bed. It's really essential. You know, it makes you happy, makes you happy, especially if you're someone that has a tendency to be negative and critical. It's really important. So that's what those kind of meditations are designed. And then what happens is we have to have some reflection on death and impermanence. That comes next in the Lam Rim death and impermanence. In, in our traditions, in Western culture, it's not something that we really want to think about very much, but it's essential because we kind of act like we're going to live forever. And so what happens is this is me in bed, two minutes in bed, waking up. And the first, the gratitude's there. So I'm already starting to feel buoyant and you can get creative about the circumstances in your life, what you want to think about. Um, so the gratitude's there, and then I, I want some humbling to realize um, this isn't going to last very long. So and I'm just going to get this sock off. It's very warm in the room that I'm in. So, okay. so there's not, um, so death and impermanence brings you down to the ground, kind of is a humbling. And when I think about it, not in a morbid sense, but I'm literally lying in bed in the morning doing this short practice. And it's then, um, I'd like to, if this is my last day, and I actually posture it that this is my last day. So how would I like the day to go? And I would like it to go well, everybody would. And I would like to have meaning in that day. And what makes meaning for me is to think about how I can help others as much as possible. That for me, I figured that out for myself. So you have to figure out what lends meaning in your life. What gives your life meaning? And when are you deeply happy? So not superficial happiness, but when is there a deep contentment where you're, you're doing some work, you're meeting with some people, you're engaged in something, or you're meditating or something, and you feel a very deep inner contentment. Okay, what you ought to do is once you find that space, okay, try to direct your life more and more there in that direction. In that direction. I mean, one example I give is, is um, you know, years ago, um, even before I was ordained, you, you'd have ideas, possibly some of you of, you know, having a holiday, having a nice holiday or something. That's happiness, going to the beach, you know. Um, some people traveling in Asia, uh, going to the beach in Thailand, whatever your, whatever your thing is, going to Europe, going to the south of France or you know, things like that. So I, I was kind of geared into, oh, when I could travel, when I could do that, that. And then I was working at a, at Vajrapani Institute, a beautiful center in California. And we hosted many, many retreats and some great lamas came and Rinpoche would, would come. And, and I just remember one night walking out with a beautiful stupa, a shrine there and walking out with my friends at the end of the session and I realized that retreat was about a month long and we were two weeks into it and there were about 80 people there that we were hosting. And I, I just realized that it was going really well, like the, the retreatants were really happy and Rinpoche was really happy and the staff was happy and it just seemed to be going really well. And I, I just got so high from that, you know, I just felt so, so I realized, I thought, this is really, this is deep happiness for me. Like, I want to do more of this. So just direct your life in that way. Just make sure, see, especially a healthy path, obviously, but do find the meaning. If you haven't found it yet, think about that because we get so caught up in life's stuff. And sometimes we're just motoring along, not really focused on, you know, what is it? Am I happy? Is this, And some people are not happy and they're not into changing it at all. So there's a lot, a lot of different things you can do like that. 
So, so that's why I mentioned death and impermanence. It kind of then says, okay, how do I want to use this day wisely? Let me do that because then my mind's peaceful. Then my mind's peaceful. And from there I set a motivation. Okay. But in the normal Lam Rim, then after death and impermanence, you get nervous and you think, and they talk about lower realms of existence and you want to avoid that. So what do I need to do? I need to take refuge. I need to figure out some protection that is really true protection from more suffering on this path. And, and if you look at your coping mechanisms, right? If you look at your coping mechanisms, when, when you get in trouble, what do you do? And I'm just curious, when you're having a bad day, when you're depressed, when you're anxious, anybody want to unmute? What do you do? What are your coping mechanisms? If you feel to say. Um, I used to want a cigarette. As soon yeah. as as soon yeah. as things went bad, my mind would be like, fuck. Sure. Cigarette, <laughs> yeah. you know, somebody has a drink of wine, recreational drugs. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and we also, we listen to music. We binge watch TVs and stream videos, right? Some people go out for a run. Some people pick up a book. Some people decide to cook or some people are glommed onto their refrigerator when they're distressed, right? So we have all these coping mechanisms. Some people call family and friends, of course. So the thing is, these things have temporary relief for us. Long-term relief, no, doesn't do it. What's gonna give you long-term relief? So you wanna check that out. That's where the refuge comes in, Buddha, Dharma, Sangha, and then you look at the qualities of them, study the qualities so that you would cultivate in your heart more refuge, that I, I really feel like that's where I'm headed. So that when you get into trouble, you're thinking about your teacher or you decide to, and, and honestly, I'll tell you some things that have worked for me and I'm a pretty ordinary person, but um, if I'm on a plane flying with terrible turbulence like that, um, instead of, you know, I've seen people on planes freaking out, you know, and they're screaming. And so I just visualize the, the 21 Taras holding the plane, you know, as images of aspects of the Buddha, instead of getting freaked out, you know, I'll think of my teacher. And um, I was thinking, um, so I remember uh, doing a lot of retreats at Laudo, this remote retreat center near, in, um, near Mount Everest. I've done a lot of retreats. And um, it's very, you know, it's cold. There's four people that live on that side of the mountain. You're really alone there. And when I used to go up in the beginning, there was no electricity, no running water. Um, it was quite intense at a time. And so sometimes if I got my mind kind of going downhill, um, I had this, a couple of emptiness books. So again, reaching for the Dharma like taking refuge in the Dharma, instead of kind of freaking out and having a meltdown, I would re read a chapter in one of those books. And honestly, it was just perfect. It was just what I needed. It was just rebalance my mind, you know, or I would say some Tara praises and ask Tara, can you please help, you know, and clearly like right then my mood would shift, something would shift. So it's, it's really possible, but you have to check yourself. So please, whatever I'm saying, whatever I talk about tonight, or tomorrow, please investigate thoroughly everything I'm saying. Um, we really ask that people analyze and check up. It, you have to make it your path. So we can't do the path for you. I wish I could, but really check up. So, and then what, what normally follows in this scope of the Lam Rim that I'm talking about right now, then come the teachings on karma. Then come the teachings, because once you then take refuge, then you need to know how to conduct yourself. So I need to look at my behavior. I need to start getting real about my mind and looking at what my mind's doing. So all of those teachings I just mentioned, precious human rebirth, death and impermanence, lower realms of existence, refuge and karma make up the first of the three scopes of the Lam Rim, three scopes of the Lam Rim that are based on your motivation. So the first scope I just mentioned, all those topics relate to what they call a lower capable being, a lower capable being's motivation. They're motivated to practice because they're terrified that what comes next, that they're gonna die and what comes next is gonna be awful, is gonna be unbearable, and that motivates them to practice. So that's why those topics are contained in that. 
And then building on that motivation, you have a medium capable being, medium capable capacity to, to study and practice. And they're motivated by the first motivation. And then they think, well, actually the life I have now still has a bunch of suffering and still isn't complete and perfect. And, and so they're motivated to practice to get out of their own suffering, to bring about an end of their own suffering. And so those topics include um, all the different ways we suffer and where you would take time to meditate on that, to really understand the suffering. We think we know suffering. We think, I mean, we, a lot of us do know some suffering. There's no question, right? But when we, when we come into the Buddhist path and we hear the word compassion, and we hear the word bodhicitta. And then we think, well, that's what I'm really interested in. And I'm interested in relieving others of suffering. Like that gives me great pain to see others suffering. Okay. But you really can't relieve them of suffering till you understand how you suffer, how you really suffer. So we have this notion of how we suffer. And some of us have experienced tremendous suffering, no question. Okay. And then as a result of that, through your empathy, you're better able to help somebody else that's going through something like that, no doubt. So it explores the middle scope, explores the different ways we suffer, and then talks about that there's an end of the suffering. So it starts to talk about fundamental ignorance. That's the key, the first link in the 12 links of, of um, the kind of chains that bind you to cyclic existence but that you can transcend them. So know that you can get out of samsara, samsara, the cycle of cyclic existence, that word that means to turn. Okay. So that takes up the, that there is an end to samsara, there is an end to the suffering permanently, and that brings you to the end of that middle capable beings motivation. And then built on that, on the first two motivations, you come to the great uh, capable being. And they're motivated that not only do they want to get themselves out of the suffering, but they're mo they think about all these other beings and say, what about them? So if they could cultivate the right view of emptiness and cultivate the fully open heart, the heart of bodhicitta, which is the enlightened attitude that involves compassion and empathy, they are then motivated to, um, to become a Buddha, to benefit all living beings. So that takes you through the whole scope of the Lam Rim. So let's talk a little bit more about karma. So I mentioned action. It is the movement of mind. And what karma says in Tibetan Buddhism is every time you think, say, or do something, it has an effect in the future. And what it does is everything you think, say, or do leaves an imprint in your consciousness leaves an imprint, it plants a seed in your consciousness. So what we want to learn how to do is I have to do good behavior. And why is that? Because that will ripen in positive results for me. If I do negative behaviors, that's going to ripen in negative results for me and more suffering. That. So in his teachings, His Holiness the Dalai Lama stresses the, the complicated nature of karma, okay? And there's a quote from Geshe Rapton, who wrote Echoes of Voidness. Some of you have probably read that book about emptiness. But Geshe Rapton talks about um, why it's complicated, why it has a complicated nature. And he talks about how limited our understanding is in general. And he says there's three ways we understand phenomena, three ways we understand through direct application of our senses. You know, you smell something, you see something. You understand? Number two, by means of logic and analysis. For instance, in the case of realizing emptiness, shunyata, okay, you're going to study and then in meditation through analysis, through investigation, you know, through that analytical meditation is how you're going to understand through logical reasoning is how you come to an understanding of emptiness. First, even intellectually, and then having a direct perception. So the third way we come to understand phenomena and understand things is a reliance on the knowledge of the Buddha, reliance on the knowledge of the Buddha. And this is where karma comes in. This is karma belongs to this third category. Only the Buddha is able to trace all the causes responsible for a particular 
phenomenon. You know, for example, the reasons that of the colors in a peacock's feather, they say, why well, only the Buddha would be able to trace why that is like that. Okay, and so, so you say, so, and I'm supposed to believe that. Okay, so again, this is reliance on the knowledge of the Buddha. So the karma teachings obviously come a little bit later in discovering Buddhism for that reason, because, and what I did as a new Buddhist when I was studying is um, there were parts of the philosophy that I didn't believe in or like. And I'm sure that's happened the same for you. You just, you know, you're not sure about the big, beginningless nature of mind. Um, I wasn't sure about reincarnation when I got into this. So partly what I did is there were some things that were taught that I totally believed right from the, I'm like, that makes perfect sense. You know, if I say to you, you have a privileged life. And what I mean by that is it's not that you're like a rich person or, but basically having food, shelter and clothing is pretty privileged for a lot of the planet. Having a computer, having access to the internet, having electricity, having a running water that you can just put your cup under and drink right out of the tap, you know, all these things, having heat. And so, so based on that, um, we have so many of it. So that's something I could kind of review through my life and say, oh yeah, I, I do have that. That was really clear. Okay. And, and what happened is I started to go through those parts of the philosophy that I could investigate and convince myself and see that there was a direct correlation. So I began to build faith in that and faith in meeting some of the teachers and checking them out seriously. And His Holiness says, you know, be a spy on your guru, check them out thoroughly. So through that process, then when I came to karma, I already had a basis of some faith to say, okay, well, let me, let me check out what they're saying about karma. And they say that if there's some things you don't agree with, just shelve it for the time being, meaning you're not thoroughly dismissing it like garbage, but I'm just going to put it over here for now because I'm not sure and I will revisit. I'll come back and revisit that. So karma belongs into that category. Again, karma is defined as the law of cause and effect, the law of cause and effect. Um, again, um, it's defined also as action. I said intention. Okay. And again, this is how it works. Karmic actions, which are impermanent and are changing from moment to moment, okay, are created by mental karma. This mental karma or predisposition, okay, is the sum total of all the karmic imprints that have been left in our mind stream from previous karmic actions. So this endless, beginningless chain. Those moments are in there. And it, this is why it's so intricate is you could step on a, in an insect today, but it doesn't ripen in, in this moment where suddenly your limbs are splitting apart and, you know, your intestines are coming out or something like that. Doesn't karma doesn't happen. It doesn't ripen instantly. That's why we have trouble believing it. We don't, and then we also see, so I always wondered, you know, why did really bad things happen to good people? Like, could you control that? That didn't make sense to me as a child. That didn't make sense. This is before the Dharma. Why did I see these horrible things happening to really good people? And then you'd meet some really nasty people and they seem to have every advantage, every good thing happening for them. So if life was like that, it didn't really seem fair to me. And then kind of what's the point? You know, if you couldn't control and you were gonna do all the good stuff in life and still get whacked in the end somehow, you know, so karma for me really answered this question. So here, this is a level of protecting our mind, protecting our mind to make sure and we're going to talk about what's the behavior, what kind of behavior, how do we want to conduct ourselves? So it's something to think about. And if we have issues with, we're not sure about reincarnation. So let's think about this for a moment. Let's think about this. Um, I wasn't sure about reincarnation. And then what I became to, uh, began to understand, I want you to think tonight before, and also tomorrow morning before we start again, um, to please reflect on this. The, when you are, um, when the mind is, um, you know, what makes up the mind, and Tibetan Buddhism says, well, there's moments of consciousness that make up the mind. 
moments of mind, they could be called moments of mind or moments of consciousness. Okay, fair enough. So, and then what they say is that the previous moment of mind, this just past moment that just passed, causes the next moment, causes the next moment. And then um, I just want to make sure, can all of you hear me well? Okay, we're not having any internet interruption. Okay, super, because we had one the other night. Um, this is great. So once again, the, um, the previous moment, the very past moment of consciousness that just passed is the cause of the next moment. The cause. So every moment has a preceding cause is what Tibetan Buddhism says. There's not just a first moment. People say, well, the mind must have started at some point. When was the first moment? There can't be a first moment because there has to be a cause for the first moment. There's always a cause and effect relationship. So I thought about that for a while, cause and effect, because we, we have, we're linear people, you know, for some of us, Monday's the first day of the week, Sunday's the end of the week, January, here we are in the first month of, of the calendar, December being the last month of the English calendar, right, so we, we have that, we know that this class started at seven, it's supposed to end at nine, we, so we conduct our lives that way, we have to, there has to be some sort of schedule and program, okay, it makes sense, but what it does is it holds our minds in a vice. So there has to be a beginning, there has to be an end, okay? But so what if there's always a cause to so think about the causes and just, let's just think about our planet. Let's think about our planet. Something caused our planet to be here, okay? And then you wanna go back to the Big Bang, okay? And any of you that are scientists or astronomers, but we talk about this Big Bang that formed our galaxy, but we're talking about billions of years, eons. No question, right? But when you think about it and you say, well, the Big Bang could have been an origin, or, but that's just, just another transition again, you know, in the grand scheme of countless eons, by, where there's just, again, another situation that caused another formation of energy, that some, some, something had some kind of biological force in it. And then, so something to think about and just going back and, thinking about everything have a preceding cause. So there's a meditation that um, comes in the mind class, a meditation on the continuum of mind, basically the continuity of consciousness. Continuity of consciousness, really helpful to think about this where for right now, I could take you back to how you got into your seat for tonight. And you could just come back of how you entered the room you know, and you knew there's the cushion and, and then muscles and all this kind of stuff, neurological activity got you into position to sit you down. Okay. But think about it. It was all created by the previous moment before that moment, you know, the moment where I'm sitting down, which was preceded by, I'm going to sit down, preceded by, I need to walk over there and get in that position to sit down, preceded by, I will enter the room where I'm going to sit, where the computer is for the class. So you can kind of trace that. My, are we are we communicating? You can kind of trace that. So then I'd say, so go back at an earlier juncture. Go back to your earliest childhood memory, let's say. And can you track five, five minutes of that? This is in the meditation. You'd slowly, like for me, I have an early memory. One of my first memories, getting out of the crib you know, close to three years old, I'm imagining, I guess, two and a half, I was in a bed at three years old. So it's got to be around that two and a half, three years old. And I, and I also, I remember there was a pedal, you could, I could put my hand through, I, I knew I had to release the pedal. So the one side went down, you know, so it was me starting then preceded by me reaching my hand out, preceded by the thought I need to reach my hand out for the pedal, preceded by my sitting up, thinking I want to get out of the crib, preceded by my sitting up, preceded by my rolling over. I want to, you know, I mean, you can see each moment of consciousness rolling. So let's say if you notice there's a connectivity between all these moments of mind, oh yes, there is a preceding cause and a preceding cause, a preceding cause. You're going to take it back or back because before childhood, you know, there was infancy and before that you were in your mother. So 
some people aren't sure about reincarnation because they say, um, I don't remember my past lives, right? Which is really common. I don't remember my past lives. And then I would say to them, do you remember being in your mother? And you can just put your hand up. Does anybody remember being in their mother that's watching right now? Okay, no hands up. It's not likely. Most people don't remember. Okay. Did that not happen? Because you don't remember? No, some of us have photos. Some of us have photos of when our mother was pregnant with us, right? So that was something for me when I, I really thought I had to think about it and think, oh, no, I don't remember that, but it happened. Okay. So let's say you just want to take yourself back to and imagine, okay, I was in my mother. And I'm imagining, and there is, Buddhism says there's mind there developing, there's mind there in the physical thing that's developing, the fetus. Could there possibly be these other moments of mind that one preceding, you know, one is preceded by the next, another one precedes that, another moment preceding that, as that mind resides there in that form now, separate from the form, but able to reside along you know, most subtle mind mounted, they say, mounted on the most subtle wind that creates our fertilization, like a rider on a horse. So most subtle mind, non-physical, separate from the body, the most subtle wind creating the body, allow, that life force that allows the body, both of them riding along life after life after life, okay? but separate entities, separate kind of things like that. So there's the mind dictating how that body is going to form, how that life is going to be. And again, moments of mind still firing, still happening in that mind. Is it? So if you want to go back, back, back to your conception, which is physical in basis, sperm and egg are physical. We know that. We can look at them under a microscope. Okay. Physical in nature, but in, in nature, but Tibetan Buddhism says the mind is there at conception. The mind, a non-physical entity, is there a conception mounted on that most subtle wind that allows a fertilization to take place. If all these other moments have a moment before the preceded it that caused it, what about the mind at conception? Couldn't it be possible that that would have a preceding moment that caused it? And that indicates a past life. So slowly you'd reflect on this over and over in this continuum of consciousness, first tracking more recent five minute periods you can trace and realize, yeah, there is a connectivity going back further and further thinking. So in some ways there's ways to poke at reincarnation if you're not sure like that. And that's where karma gets really important then is we want to make positive imprints. Now we have to, that's going to create better chance to practice better um, rebirth and more happiness for you like that. So karma ripening in this lifetime is easier to understand if we can, you know, you slap somebody and somebody slaps you back. Okay. Like, but, and on a, on a gross level, we see, we can see some immediate results of many actions. I do remember um, that I was, I was attending a great Lama called Kirti Senchab Rinpoche. He used to travel to all of our centers in the 90s in particular. He passed away in 2006. And I had the incredible good fortune to travel all over the world with him, uh, planning his tours. And they said that when you're attending a Lama like that, like Lama Zopa Rinpoche or anyone like that, that you're supposed to have really good merit to be able to do it, but that your karma can purify more quickly. And I remember I was in the um we were in taiwan and i was making tea for all the guests that would arrive to see rinpoche tea or coffee things like this and one guest came and they wouldn't leave and they were being really kind of obstinate and really difficult and they had seen rinpoche before and they were you know knocking on the door of the apartment at all hours and it was getting really hard and then they showed up again and rinpoche said to let them in and I was making them tea and while I and I had such a negative mind state when they showed up again and I was making tea and I scalded myself with the tea and I and I, I just kind of laughed I was like instant karma yeah. but the thing is karma doesn't always ripen like that and I will talk about ripening effects and how things ripen one thing that's really helpful with karma is not to scare you but 
basically um it's all based on your motivation so much of it is based on your motivation for doing a deed so for instance we sometimes accidentally step on insects we don't mean to we don't have any intention to kill an insect a lot of people don't if you're a buddhist but sometimes you accidentally step on an insect right so if you have tremendous regret at that time changes the negative karma you know making it smaller um, if you have no motivation to kill the insect, it makes it very different. If you apply an antidote right away, doing some sort of purification practice for it, or at least by the end of the day, also powerful in dismantling a negative imprint like that. So one of the things we can understand about karma, because karma is very intricate, is four general rules or characteristics four general rules or characteristics. And I certainly will make time for questions as well throughout the different sessions like that. So for a karmic, a complete karmic action, it has to have an intention. So I said motivation. There has to be an object involved, and I'll talk more about that. There's an action and there's a completion of the action, okay? But even incomplete activities can still create karma. So. Okay, so let's look at these four characteristics, four general rules in a sense by which karma functions. Okay, number one, karma is definite. Karma is definite. And what that means is um, you do something positive, you definitely get a result of happiness for you in the future. You're planting a positive seed in your consciousness. Buy somebody flowers with a good intention. You give somebody an offering with a good intention. You help your parents with a good intention. So I keep saying with a good intention. That colors, that colors the outcome. So again, if you're doing something resentfully, could it, it, we have a lot of mixed karmas. So again, you're doing a good deed, so you get some credit, some positive credit for that, but you're really resentful and angry when you're doing it. So tainted, tainted karma, negative like that. So again, if our intention's positive, our action will be correspondingly positive and create more positive karmic imprints um, or mental karma, this predisposition for the future, like that. If our intention's not positive, more negativity is created, which will result in suffering in the future for you, for your mind, not suffering for others, for your mind. Karma is definite. That's number one. And they'll say, like, if you plant an apple seed, you're going to get an apple tree. You don't get an oak tree get an apple seed, definitely. Okay, number two, karma is dynamic. Karma is dynamic. It increases is what it means, okay? So not only is the karmic result inescapable in nature and quality, the karmic imprints we create in our mind stream grow and produce results that can be greater than their cause. Okay. So in the case of negative karma, this is scary for us because you go, well, I stepped on an insect and I didn't have any kind of antidote applying. I wasn't even a Buddhist. I killed lots of insects when I wasn't even a Buddhist. I didn't know. It was, it was all I could do. I didn't know. And I was obeying my parents, so I get some credit. right? They would, my mother would say, in the spring, go out and vacuum the porch and get all the insects. And I kind of happily went out there. But also, I was following you know, what they wanted me to do. That. So I didn't know. So later, you know, saying it grows and they say it's expandable, like I'm killing an elephant, like I'm killing a human without applying any antidote of purification can be overwhelming. But the thing is, you do the best you can. Okay? And once you know, then you can clean up your behavior. Okay? And I will talk about Vajrasattva. We will do some Vajrasattva practice um, in this program tomorrow. That. So, but also good deeds expand as well. Good deeds expand. So meaning if you buy somebody flowers, you're helpful to somebody in some way, um, and you don't get super angry before you dedicate the merit for whatever deed you're doing, anger tends to destroy a lot of our merit or good energy, positive energy, anger and other afflictive emotions destroy it. So if I dedicate, so in the beginning of an activity, we have motivation, at the end of an activity with a dedication, at the end of this session, we'll do a dedication like that. And what we do is we're sealing in whatever merit or positive energy we've created before we might destroy it with anger or something like that. So 
Good activities can also flourish and grow. Karma is dynamic. Number three, karma is specific. Okay, We don't experience a result of anything we didn't create the cause. So we're not experiencing the result of somebody else's deeds. They're not experiencing our deeds. Okay. So again, we're not taking on the karma of other people. Even the Buddha couldn't do this because he would take on all of our karma, all of our negative karma, okay? So you can't blame the person you know, next to you in the plane when the plane is crashing, it's their fault like that. It's just your own experience that you're gonna experience. Number four, karma is dormant. Karma is dormant. So karmic imprints are never lost but over time will come to fruition if you create the right causes and conditions for them to ripen like that. So if you're building a business, right, and you've tried before and you failed and you failed and you failed you to every good intention and you treated all the people that worked with you and helped you um, really wonderfully and all that, but you, you just never got the business going. You just didn't have a business mind. It wasn't successful over and over. Still, the, the good nature of your treating people well, taking care of what you could, trying your hardest, all of that will create positive things for businesses in the future, for your businesses in the future, and, and for, for your life in the future, like that. If you're doing negative things in life and feeling like, oh, I got away with that, you know, you don't get away with it. You don't get away with it. It will come up and ripen at some point, but here's how things can change. So things will ripen in future lives, okay, unless you've applied a purification, purification technique before it ripens. Okay, so for instance, I was able to do a Vajrasattva retreat in this life. I was really happy about that many years ago. I really wanted to do it for a while, okay, and I got to do that retreat, which normally if you're doing it full time, um, it will take you about two to three months to recite the hundred syllable mantra of Vajrasattva, the long mantra like that. I do, I do some every night. I do Vajrasattva practice every night just to minimize all the negative karma I've done through the day like that. It's not like I'm purposely trying to create negative karma, but just because I don't have a realization of emptiness, there's some negative karma created. And there's, you know, I'm not a perfect being, so there's always some you know, self-cherishing thoughts like that. So it's not that you will get away with it. So if you do something negative, right, and haven't applied the purification, it will come up in later lives. If you do something really positive and you, you're still not seeing any, you, you get, let's say you give a lot of money away. You give a lot of money to people. You don't have that much money, but you're giving, you know, and, you, and they say that, you know, generosity is the cause of your own prosperity, but you're not noticing that you're, getting richer, or it's not coming in, it, it will be there in future lives then if it doesn't, if you don't necessarily destroy some of that merit, it will be there in future lives. That's a karma is dormant. So those are the four characteristics. So producing karma in what happens in a very uncontrolled, unaware manner, which is what a lot of us do a lot, is that we're caught up in this this kind of cycle, this spiral of unhappiness and suffering, okay? Buddhism says um, everything comes from the mind. Everything comes from the mind. So just thinking about that, we want to be very careful of um, what, how we're showing up, what, what's going on with our mind. And that's why I like to meditate. That's why I like to meditate. I found it really, really helpful um, to basically cultivate a rich meditation practice and the reason is it helps me get in touch with my mind. It, it shows me my mind. It helps me calm my mind. And it helps me deal with my mind and change my mind. So an example I give you, if you're new to meditation practice, you're struggling to get a meditation practice set up, you had a meditation practice, you're not doing it anymore, is what I would say is just get a place in your house, some simple little corner, whatever, that you're not going to walk over a lot if you can doesn't have to be a room, but I used a closet at one point, cleaned out a part of a closet and just someplace I can sit. I put a little table, a little, you know, cardboard box turned upside down, whatever. doesn't have to be fancy, but if you want to light a candle, just a place I can, it becomes a safe space for you. You might put a cushion you're comfortable 
You can absolutely sit meditating in a chair. If you can keep a chair there, comfortable cushion, have your shawl there, whatever you want to wrap up in and make it conducive. Make it. And then I was working for a magazine in San Francisco many years ago, and I didn't really know how to meditate, but I had done one course and wanted to try, and I thought this was maybe a good idea. And, and there were there were stressors at the magazine, at this work. Obviously, there were people, there were... 30 people I worked with, some of them, you know, were challenging and things. And so what I could do is come home from work. And normally we have a ruminating mind. So you have a mind that's turning, you know, this and that, and, and then you start negative stories about people. Then you go into work and you tell one colleague the negative story about this person and they carry it on to somebody else. Then you are guilty of negative speech which creates problems. And so, so you have these things that don't really help when you're dealing with a difficult person or it doesn't help your mind. So what I, what I did was I had a little room and I had a little loft above the bed and I made a little space there and I come home from work and before I had dinner and sometimes I was going to go out with friends before I went out, I just had my time and I, I crawled up into the loft and i and the first 10 minutes was just disengaging from the day. I give yourself the space. So we come in from our busy lives. And even if you're working at home and then suddenly you shut down all the email and, and now I'm going to go to my meditation cushion or my seat. And I just expect the meditation to arise organically. Plunk yourself down on a seat and but the, let the mind settle down. Give yourself five or ten minutes. Focus on the breathing. Scan your body and let your body relax. We forget that step. When the mind and body is really relaxed, meditation comes organically, comes organically, fantastic. In fact, it's such a tool for you. So what I would do is after that 10 minutes, and he was in my mind, this one guy I was working with, so difficult, yelling at people, he was a big guy, intimidating, he was scary. And I had to do a project with him. So I'm thinking about him, I'm thinking, I have to go in, I have a meeting with him tomorrow. What am I gonna do? I don't really like it, I don't really like him. It's so I kind of, so I'd start thinking those thoughts on the cushion. And then I thought, well, does he not have any redeeming qualities? I'm just seeing negative. Does he not have any redeeming qualities? Then I'd start to focus on that. He does have some redeeming qualities and I'd start to go through those. He's talented at his job. He's actually quite articulate. He's very creative. He's, you know, kind of go down. I went, well, he's, He's really good at what he does and his staff seem to like him. So he obviously takes care of them, you know, and so there, there it was. And then what I did is this was maybe five or 10 minutes, just staying with that. I started to see him in a different light, you know, multifaceted, not just a jerk, multifaceted. There were, we're all multifaceted. So am I, I had aspects of myself. I wasn't fond of and other aspects that, Seem okay? Everybody's like that. So I made a little deal with myself that the next day when I go in, I would try as much as possible to focus on his good qualities, on the good qualities that I was finding right now. And maybe I could compliment him genuinely on one of those good qualities during the meeting. But you have to be sincere. It has to be sincere. It's not about the false flattery. So this is simply analytical meditation. That's all it is. I'm analyzed. I was analyzing him, analyzing him. What happens is, and we're taught, and Rinpoche always says about doing analytical meditation on the Lam Rim, and we get bored, and Westerners say, I don't know how to do it. It's boring. Or, or people say with the death meditation, okay, I've done it. I did it. I got it. Right. Do you have it here? Okay. Do you have it here? We have it here. So analytical meditation is designed to move the intellectual understanding of something to here, to a spiritual realization. That's what changes your life, changes your mind like that. It's really powerful. So, um, so I went into work the next day and it, and it does work slowly. Like I noticed I was more relaxed. And I was real, and sometimes his negative qualities would come in. I could see he was a little abrupt and he was a little, and then I found a moment where I could sail through. He had a nice shirt on and I said, I really like your shirt. It's a great color on you. And suddenly I got his attention. He, he 
He's like, you know, suddenly he's noticed, oh, I get positive feedback from Amy. Because there were some people in the office that didn't like him. And I heard him yelling at those people. But now he suddenly got, oh, I get positive, you know, I get a compliment from Amy. So he's more open to, you know, and then he'd, we'd start sharing ideas in the meeting or suppose he's designing something. And then he'd have an idea. And I said, that's a really great idea. Like, I love how that looks on the page. That's, you know, suddenly he's, so slowly it went on like that. There weren't, it didn't mean there weren't times I wasn't still scared of him. I'd hear him yelling at people on and on, but slowly we became friends. So, but it was my process, my mind. I'm not saying he didn't have a factor, but I had to do the work on my mind to transcend. You can make friends with anybody. You can make friends with anybody. It makes your world much more pleasant, much more pleasant. Right. And you're planting more positive seeds in your mind stream. So it's what we want to try to do. And that's where the meditation practice comes in. So when we hear about analytical meditation on the Lam Rim, and we don't want to do it. Okay. The thing is, we do analytical meditation all the time. We just don't do it on the right things. My, my previous analytical meditation on this guy that I worked with at the magazine was all focusing on analyzing all his negative qualities so that I could convince myself that he was a jerk. There's no benefit in that. You want to analyze in a realistic way. And when I went back, I went, you know what? He's not just bad. He's got all these other positive qualities. That was the reality that was there. And that helped me balance the view so that I could finally embrace and really stay with the positive and become friends with him and see his good qualities. And and when I was friends with him, I saw mostly good qualities. I'd see the frustration in the other thing. And then he started to come to me to say he felt upset when he yelled at somebody else. And he said, sometimes I just can't control my mind. You know, and he said, he goes, what do you do? He said to me. And then I talked to him about meditation. So there's like connection. There's ways we can positively affect our planet. So that's our role. I, I think a lot of being a Tibetan Buddhist for me is, and just being a good citizen on the planet is to try to create as many healthy, positive relationships as we can with others. And there's a lot of others out there now, aren't there? A lot of others, a lot of people we make other. So it keeps your mind not peaceful. And, um, and I think it's really helpful to try to understand another voice point of view and things. So, you know, both of our countries, the United States and England right now are struggling, I'd say, in ways with their governments, with their governments. I mean, I would, I have to kind of joke a little bit with you of the three different prime ministers you had in a very short period of time. And I'm not saying the United States is any better, but um, I was joking with a friend. I said, oh, it's almost like Italy, you know, 94 governments in 54 years. And um, and the United States just went through an election process that surprised um, more progressive people, which normally doesn't, midterm elections don't usually go the way they just did. However, what we did find um, was the countries divided right in the middle. Countries just split apart right in the middle. These people thinking this thing and these people thinking another thing. So what happens is you can find positive ways to engage I've done this in a lot of interfaith groups to engage with people that have a really, really different opinion than I have. And it's helpful to not use trigger language, so to speak, like certain words that are always associated with liberals and certain words that are always associated with conservatives to find a kind of middle way so that we can actively listen and really hear somebody else's viewpoint. I don't have to agree with them. But I can, once I listen and see them as a whole human being, there can be positive engagement like that. And you can even become friends, even though you have different opinions about things. It really helps the planet be more harmonious. From Lama Yeshe, he said, the more convinced one becomes of the inner law of cause and effect, the more energy one gets to change and improve oneself in one's life. I, I have to say, and please check up yourself, but it, it's like when I first understood, um, heard about karma, just heard about it and went, well, I've done all this negative stuff. And then when they kind of gave me the list of, well, here's how you can conduct yourself and here's things you can do to purify 
you know, I wanted to get to work on it. And I feel more and more empowered that I've been able to clean away some of the stuff. You know, certainly more stuff gets created every day, more negative stuff. But I'm, I'm more engaged in, you know, as soon as something negative comes out of my mouth, okay, I need to clean that up. To, you know, I have a way of doing something about it. It's not just out there. There's, and, and here's another thing. There's no point feeling guilty. So we have this word guilt in our language. And I remember Rinpoche once talking to some of us once, and he said, guilt is just a negative cycling of the mind, obsessive negative cycling of the mind. It has no benefit. It just ruminates negatively in a circle. Regret is different. Regret is you can feel sad and feel, but then you're planning to do something about it and have a remedy, an antidote you'll apply like Vajrasattva practice. But the guilt is negative. And the Tibetans, this, this is something that attracted me a lot to Tibetan Buddhism. They don't have a word for guilt in their language. How about that? I thought that was wonderful. So, so think about it. There's no point in feeling bad, bad, bad. Just get on your cushion and do your, do your purification things. We can do prostrations. We can recite prayers. We can meditate on emptiness. We can recite mantras. You can do Vajrasafa practice. You can do a Vajrasafa retreat. There's so many ways to counteract like that. So it does give energy. Excuse me. So, and here's another thing that next thing where we get hooked is a lot of our actions are based on this mistaken belief that we're separate permanent beings. We have this very strong sense of the eye and every, everything that maneuvers around this eye, anything that interferes with, excuse me, my agenda is gonna upset me. So we cling to pleasure, we try to avoid pain all around this separate entity I've created in myself. Um, we develop a lot of desire and, and loathing for anything that interferes with my agenda or anybody dear to me, you know? And when you're confronted with sense objects, you know, if it's, it's a sense object that I like, then I need to have more of it. I need to get that. And then I'm projecting a fan, fantasized notion onto that. You know, something negative is happening. All I'm going to see are the flaws. And then I project and I underestimate the reality that's out there. So all these things keep us um, based in continuing to create negative karma for ourselves because we don't understand. We have a misknowing of reality, K-N-O-W. We miss no reality. Because of that, we get in so much trouble, okay? So, so partly then what happens is we also get attached to samsara. Samsara is a Sanskrit word, as most of you know. It means to turn, to cycle, okay? And all of it is suffering. We're turning through birth, old age, sickness, and death. All of it is suffering. Not that there's not a beauty in birth and miracle and and I've seen some people pass away really peacefully and almost like they transcended something and but there's a lot of suffering in that. So what what happens for us is we are, as you know, um, we're going to fix some sort. We're going to find a solution to this, to this human condition, right? It's futile. Forget it. Give it up because there's no fixing samsara. It's imperfect. It's flawed. It's damaged. So. For instance, and I give you the, the everyday things like when your phone breaks, when your computer gets old and breaks, you need a new computer. Somebody dings your car and you get upset. Like it goes on and on and on. You know, the, the challenges in your relationships with your partner, perhaps, or you don't like that your kid is doing that or having that job or living there or having that partner. It's endless. It's endless. You're never going to sort it. And I hear people saying, um, when I get the job, when I get my new job, everything's going to be great. You know, when I find a new partner, everything's going to be wonderful. You know, when my kid goes off to school, then I'm going to get the house together. You know, there's always going to be something. There's always going to be something. You know, so think about your mind. If I could get my mind together, that would be something. That would be something. If I can really transcend, perfect my mind, become a Buddha, that changes everything. So, but we have this other concept, the externals. Take care of the externals, okay? And we're brainwashed by it a lot. I mean, that's our conditioning of our culture. Okay.
So karma basically insists and starts talking about and and what happens is most of us come from Judeo-Christian belief system. There's a God, the creator, and there's a lot of this, it, it puts us kind of, um, there's an external creation to everything that didn't involve us. Buddhism says everything comes from the mind, not a separate God, the creator. Everything comes from the mind. So I'm involved. It, not only am I involved, I'm at the controls. With a God, the creator, you're not at the controls. I find it disempowering personally, you know, and granted you can pray to God and you can be a righteous person and things like that. And I've seen righteous people suffer tremendously. So you kind of wonder is, is that the path or are they just experiencing karma from previous lives right now, but can't God fix them? Can't God save them? And I don't know the kind of God you might've believed in or that you were, um, raised with because my memory for me is I was raised in a God kind of religion was it was the God was all powerful, omnipotent, like omnipotent. I don't know what, what did you, did you have that term for God? Was your God omniscient or omnipotent? What would you say? Both. Both. Okay. So for me, what happens, the Buddha is omniscient, not omnipotent, omniscient. Okay. Omnipotent, all powerful. For me, you could fix it. Omniscient just means you know everything. And if you know everything, you're performing perfectly, but you'd know everybody's minds in all world systems simultaneously. That's the Buddha's mind. Okay. And because you know that if you have people that come to you and ask for your advice, you know perfectly what to, how to advise them, how to advise them to get free. That's the Buddha's role. That's your teacher's role. Like that. That's like teachers, like His Holiness the Dalai Lama, Lama Zopa Rinpoche. Okay. But omnipotent, for me, you could, you should fix it. A, a two-year-old dying of leukemia, if you're omnipotent, if I'm all powerful, I should be able to fix it. So, and I know that there are teachings in Christianity and things of, of, well, you know, what that child might be showing that, that aspect, you know, there are people that, you know, believe things like that. But so it was something that I just started thinking about is, is if I have no control over this, because it's somebody else is going to do it for me. But karma is a ruling dynamic principle of all phenomena. And the Buddha says, whether you believe it or not, it's happening, it's unfolding like that. And, and of all phenomena in the nature of dependent arising, okay, it follows that nothing is coincidental, nothing is haphazard, nothing is self existent or permanent. This is from the Buddha. Nothing is again coincidental, haphazard, self existent or permanent. Okay, so this notion of dependent arising that everything arises in dependence on other things, you arise in dependence on causes and conditions, your parents wanted to have a child, or the sperm and egg came together, right? You are you come into existence based on your parts. That's your body and mind. Those are your parts. And you come into existence based on the most subtle dependent arising is your mind, your mind merely labeling on your body and mind, your name, you come into existence. Laura, Celia, like that. And then Celia comes into existence. Like that doesn't mean that there isn't a woman sitting there that conventionally exists. But think about what we impute on that. But we put this major layer, it's a mere imputation, according to the highest school, it's a mere label. But we are so invested in it. We were so caught up in it. Right. So, so the fact dependent arising is very, very helpful, because there's a cause and effect relationship to everything that nothing just pops in randomly like that. So it means also that every single thing that happens to us is our responsibility. Every single thing that happens to us is our own responsibility. Karma is about taking responsibility. Karma is about taking responsibility. And that's hard for a lot of people. But, you know, so in a sense, it's a breathtaking, frightening, but also liberating thought. You know, instead of that, I could do everything right and I can still be killed and mutilated or whatever, you know, 
but understanding that that could still happen but that then i'm purifying negative karma then i'm purifying negative karma and right now i can engage in in quite a lot of purification so that 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 doesn't happen so they say for instance if you had the karma to have a malignant brain tumor and to die of it you could do enough purification practices that it may ripen in a headache you have a bad headache one day so we can shortcut the negative things that are going to happen to us so it's exciting in that sense in buddhism again i mentioned the cycle of samsaric existence we have uncontrolled death and rebirth determined by our karma okay we inhabit a particular universe this current lifetime this samsaric realm because of the karma we've produced that got us into this situation like that so in a sense we've got this karmic display playing on the movie screen of our life every moment like that so so watch what's going on in the movie screen of your life and that's what meditation is about in my meditation practice just allowing yourself to be still some part of the day which most of us are not allowing yourself to be still get your phone out of the room turn you know and just to sit and notice what comes up in the mind so even when we first started and i said just disengage from the external activities bring yourself into the space and as you just start deeper breathing of course thoughts are going to come up your lists of what you want to do different things that happen during the week and of course and then just see them like bubbles rising up and let them go let them they filter out after a while they filter out after a while slowly slowly let them go now they're going to come up but that and then you can get down into other meditations and or just feel the sense of your being that start to see how your mind is functioning and, and the mind is different every day it's different sometimes you're in a good mood sometimes not a good mood sometimes in the morning a little low energy then afternoon more energy so in buddhism we give up the idea that outside forces external things or persons cause our happiness or unhappiness okay we're not dependent on that external sensory pleasure getting getting all the juice from that we understand that the causes of happiness lie exclusively within our own mind they depend on on numberless karmic imprints we've collected in our mind stream since beginningless time okay it's in our hands that we create the causes and conditions for them to ripen okay so it does away with the ideas of i'm a victim i'm being persecuted okay of irrational and undeserved things happening to us you know and and you can get rid of the question why me you know you can get rid of it's not fair it's not fair you can get rid of all that okay because with buddhism something happens yes of course me i created this yes of course me i created this the only way it could have happened but it's hard again it's hard for us to accept that it's hard to accept that but it's a little bit of stepping up like you know and, and, and the example i give um i moved to this center i moved across the country about a year and year and a half ago from pennsylvania to california Rinpoche had asked if i could help this center land of medicine buddha it's a beautiful place a lot of our centers as you know are struggling to emerge from the pandemic and this is a large center over 100 acres uh, i can't even tell you what it costs to run a center in california now and and i'll i'll give you another um so as you know about the fires in california quite bad and there was a fire that got to basically nearly across the street from Vajrapani institute in 2020 and in that community, an hour from the center where I am now, several of my friends lost their homes in a fire and really bad fire. So they and all that community evacuated to Land of Medicine Buddha, where I'm living now. So we are closer to the coast, but still the fire danger is there. So um, all the insurance carriers that were um, insuring residential retreat centers in California, whether it's a yoga center, retreat centers like ours, Vipassana centers, but big retreat places. It could be Christian like that. They canceled all the fire insurance. They said they don't want to, they can't deal with it. It's too expensive. Canceled the fire insurance. 
so so we're getting there's a state the state had to intervene and offer plans and but they don't insure everything so one center up north i was comparing and i was calling all these centers to find out who were they using what did they do about a year ago when i got to the center and one center in the north of california said they have a lot of money and they said they had a 15 million dollar in insurance plan for 40,000 a year, which was actually pretty good, $40,000 a year. And so that carrier dropped them and they now have a $10 million coverage. Are you ready for this? For $300,000 a year. That's what it's costing them in insurance. So trying to run a center like Land of Medicine Buddha, very, very difficult. And so I came in and there were some instructions from Rinpoche, but it just didn't seem to go in that direction. And I had a really hard year, really rough year. And um, so, you know, I just, I had to own it. I was like, this is great purification for me. And, and I could kind of look at each person I was working with and kind of pick out negative things they might be doing to me. But then I went, I can see that, but I really can't go there because it's just, it's not reality. It's not the reality I'm living in. And so I really kind of spent this time and tried to really face up to the purification and this is great for me and I'm going to die with this stuff on, you know, taken care of. And, and so it's shifted quite a bit now and, um, you know, feels a lot better, but I'm, I'm also glad I did the purification. I have no regrets that I've um, made this move. I don't know how long I'll stay or whether they'll want me to stay, you know, longer and things, but just really want to help. And um, so it's interesting, you can have a different attitude. I could have sat and wallowed. I mean, it could have been really tremendously painful and awful. And then me blaming everybody would have alienated me from everybody incredibly, you know? So, so kind of working with it and, and actually talking with these people to let them know a little bit of what was going on and, or why, why don't you want me to do this project? And then dialoguing about it and going, oh, okay. You know, that makes sense. And so, and just realizing, you know, comes from my mind. So, so it was really, really helpful. Can you own it? It's not easy all the time. It's not easy at all like that. So something I want you to think about a little homework assignment um, for tonight till tomorrow is, is there karma? Is it all karma or is there free will? Is everything just dictated by karma or do you have choice? the matter. So I want you to think about that um, until we meet till tomorrow. Make a note to remind myself. Okay. So again, um, we and and Robert Thurman, the great scholar, sometimes talks about in our mind stream how karma is the product of actions of body, speech, and mind. Our body, speech, and mind, as I said, creates an imprint in your consciousness, what you're doing. And he calls it spiritual DNA, spiritual DNA. You know, an infinitely soft entity that nonetheless has an absolute capacity of retaining every karmic imprint produced by our body, speech, and mind, no matter how minute. Um, there's a huge number of these karmic imprints and you know, so just talking about um, the dormancy is there until the conditions arise. And, you know, our mind stream is saturated with these karmic seeds, positive as well as negative. They lie dormant, but create a potential ability on our consciousness. And that means they will ripen when appropriate conditions come together. That. So you do want to think about, and I know that one of the things, for instance, is is one of the things I kept saying at the center, Land of Medicine Buddha, is I can see how, and I've, I've been involved with the center years before I was running another center an hour away. So I was often coming over to Land of Medicine Buddha where some of my friends lived. You know, it was our, our sister center. And it's a great center. You know, it's beautiful shrines and beautiful hiking trails and temples. And I mean, it could blow the roof off the world in a good way, this center. It could really be a beacon. And what I keep saying to people is if we get the right conditions, meaning harmony for one, the center hasn't had a lot of harmony over years, like that just hasn't been its nature. But if we hire the right people, we're just slowly starting to hire, we don't have a lot of money, hire the right, but I've seen some people come in that I thought would be great, and then they've just kind of gone right out, like it just, they just didn't stay. And if we can get enough of the right people to stay, 
all of a sudden the karma really shifts. I give you an example is Jamyang London. If you remember, because you're close by, I mean, you're not that close by, but you've been to London and Jamyan London went through a few years. They changed directors a couple of times. They, they went through a challenging period. A lot of centers do, right? And then suddenly conditions change. They get this woman, this nun, Fabian, who's an old friend of mine. She's one of the best directors, I think, in the FPMT. Somehow some connection, Geshe Namdak is sent. And the center's just really thriving. It's really, So in a very short period, the right, so think about your own life. What conditions am I making? So again, some of my friends called me or different students called during the pandemic and they said, I, I'm really addicted. I'm binge watching shows. I'm streaming all these videos too many hours a day. And when I get up from the bed, my neck is sore, my back sore. I've been eating all this junk food. And, you know, so this habit started and think about the conditions you're making. And then I just said, well, why don't you let's you can't do a cold turkey let's be realistic and slowly wean yourself off can you take a half an hour from that kind of activity and put it into you wanted to read that dharma book so what if you just half an hour a day really force yourself go to the dharma book or get that 20 minute meditation you wanted to do you know i'll, I'll email you the meditation and 20 minutes just 20 minutes a day you can so now you can just push a button on your phone meditation comes up or something on your computer, do a guided meditation, you know, and, and start to create that as a habit. I know it's hard getting started, but slowly, like, think about what causes you're making, what conditions you're making, things like this. If some of you remember, um, years ago, there was a movie called The Silence of the Lambs. Does any, did anybody see that film? Um, it, it was quite a good film, but it's a horror film. It's really kind of a horrifying film. And and so um, one of my friends was talking that she really liked horror films, and I don't really like many horror films. And and so somebody said, yeah, well, I mean, when you're dying, is do you want Silence of the Lambs coming up in your mind? Is that what, like, because she was saying she watched it again and again. And so, th again, think about what's coming into your mind. What are you reading? What kind of programs do you watch? Videos? What kind of sites do you look at? Do you do a lot of social media? And what, and just... And what, what happens is when you stop with your phone and you actually shut it off for a moment, right? Notice how you feel for a few minutes. Just take a couple minutes and just see how you feel. Do you feel really good? Do you feel kind of neutral? Do you feel less than good? Like what, what's the experience that you have after, you know, sometimes you need to, you take a break and watch a movie. There's nothing wrong with that, right? But how many hours, you know, over, you know, watching cat videos and, you know, you, so, so just be, just be cautious of what is entering your mind and, and, but you have to check how it makes you feel. So let me just, um, pause for a moment. And I just, if you want to unmute, does anybody have any questions, please? Yeah. Hi, and just feel um, free to unmute. Yeah. And just, yes, please. Um, it, it's not really a question, but um, I'm just really glad that you said that about um, thinking where you're putting your mind, you know, um, because I've noticed and I think am I just being a bit chicken? I mean, I never watch horror movies because I would never sleep, you know, um, and I'm actually getting more and more, you know, I'll pick up a book or something or, or maybe watch something on the TV. And I think, oh, this is just, this is just depressing. I don't, I just don't want to watch that. And I'll, I'll find myself watching very, if you like, lowbrow, you know, very sort of lightweight things and, and reading sort of quite lightweight things. I think, oh, I just want to read about people being happy and having a good time. <laughs> I just, yes. uh, um, and it's part of you sort of thinks, well, you should take life more seriously and there's terrible things going on. But I, I'm mostly, I think, well, there's no point in bathing in that, you know. I, I actually want to right. reflect some good things around and 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 spend a lot of time, you know, in, with wildlife and out in the fresh air and just appreciating the clouds, things like that. You know? Yes, yes. I think that I think that's brilliant. And I I think first of all, we're all wired differently. 
-hmm. So again, um, you do want to find what's right for you. Yeah. And, um, and I do find, I mean, I, I do, I have this like sideline, little sideline coaching business now that I got certified in the pandemic. And so a lot of people come to me and suffering depression, anxiety, Dharma students, non-Dharma students, um, with, you know, just, just basic exercises people can do, but you have to find what's going to resonate with you. You know, for, for one guy, he really wants to go to the gym and just get on machines and that cuts his thing of like recreational drug use and cigarettes and he does less of it at the gym and to go out in nature is incredibly helpful for a lot of people and for some of them that are sedentary that's a stretch for them like they they haven't been able they haven't thought of going to a city park and it just wasn't part of their thing but i just said you know once a week you know twice a month try a new activity and you know even and you can make it short it doesn't have to be a long activity you just take an hour one week and off you go and so something that stretches you outside to just change the habit if you find the habits not and, and you know it's not going well and the other thing is when you are finding things that like you're saying celia to pick up your mind and if it keeps your mind in a positive space great yeah you know you don't need extra things that are going to stress you out in you know like that, but everybody has to find their own way that they want to do it. So I yeah. think that's really helpful. Yeah, yeah. I think I, I wasn't very in touch with how I feel about things. And over the years, I've become a little bit more in touch. So I'm suddenly realizing that I'm becoming anxious if there's a negative book or program or something. And I think, mm -hmm. oh, oh, this is making me feel anxious. And I don't I don't want to, you know, go there. What, what's sure. the point of it? you know so that's right but that is yeah just learning to know yourself a bit perfect uh, absolutely i mean that's what this path is about a lot is getting getting to know yourself getting to learn who you are and then figuring out what you need to clean out and what you want to enhance of your qualities and so another thing that's also gone gone on in the world um with the pandemic and um economic downturns and um oh my gosh you know as you know in the states we've we've ruled on um, abortion, you know, we're like, going, you know, it's just, it's just so strange what's going on in some places. So, so I look at a little bit of the news, j just enough to what I need, you know, to, but again, it, watch if you're a news junkie, if you, cause I know some people that incredible anxiety, they're getting anxiety and anger based on the news. So again, I do read the news. There's some horrible things going on in the news. The news is often horrible. I mean, that's why they prey on us. It's sensational to get us to watch it, to look at it, to read it. So limit it, limit your time so that you can. So, and what I can do is you can always do Tong Len meditation with the news. If it's the war in Ukraine, a lot of suffering, incredible suffering. So again, instead of getting overwhelmed, um, imagine taking on the suffering as you inhale let it, it doesn't harm you. It goes to a constricted knot here of your self-cherishing at your heart. Just a constricted knot of your self-cherishing. Let it dissolve and harm that. And then I'm more spacious, happier because I've reduced my self-cherishing. And as I exhale, I'm gonna give them all my privilege, all my happiness, all the heat I have, the electricity right now, which so many Ukrainians don't have, offer them peace, living in a peaceful place, which most of us do. Um, and you can just do that mounted on the breath, they say, inhale, exhale, inhale. And I can just sit in front of the computer five minutes a day, something positive from watching, from looking at the news. That's all. Yeah. So diff different ways to keep the, the mind buoyant, really helpful. Any other questions? Uh, okay, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, uh, just uh, in relation to, uh, let's say, uh, you discussed a couple of things about uh, karma being uh, entirely under your control to a certain degree. And I just like to ask, ask how it would be interpreted in a couple of situations. I think you mentioned sometimes in the first situation you know, you've often seen when you're talking about the idea of a Christian God, how could he, how could he or she leave a four-year-old to get terminal cancer? And 
that that was one reason why a lot of people wouldn't believe in in, in that kind of thing. And with the idea of karma, then would would that you know four year old would it still be a result of his or her actions in earlier on in her life or in a previous life and or would it be down to possibly let's say it's just the randomness of life and this can happen to all of us and it's how we would react let's say you know and and in that regard you know if the person and her family reacted well she or he may die but in subsequent lives it will be better for her vice and sarah and in the second case uh because i i would understand that aspect but and in the second case for instance let's say you have a let's say a plane crash which is even more kind of random you know yeah and you might have people who die and then other people are injured again you know, is there any element of chaos or randomness in this? And is it just how we would react to the situation, let's say? Is is that what you mean by karma? So no, karma is saying there's no randomness. Oh, okay. There's no randomness. So what they're saying is basically um, that child that might get leukemia or cancer, the young child, the cause was created. The child may not have done anything really negative in this life, you know, at that young age, would have come from past lives. There would have been imprints okay. or seeds in okay. their consciousness that created them to get sick as a young child. And and one of the things that, and I will talk more about the cause in relation and what, how did things ripen? Why do they ripen like that? Um, I am going to go into that tomorrow. The, okay. um, one of the things one teacher during the AIDS epidemic in the 80s, when it was really, really bad, I was working as a hospice uh, counselor in San Francisco, and a friend of mine was involved as well. And we were students of this Lama I mentioned before, Kirti Senchab Rinpoche, and she had a friend that was um, dying of AIDS. And then he committed suicide at the end, which a lot of AIDS patients did, and assisted suicide, whatever they call it. and. And so she went to the Lama and asked him, and he said um, he may take rebirth as a um, a small animal or baby that gets that dies young again, because they hadn't finished out what was supposed to naturally be finished on its own. There was still karma there, and then he he basically interrupted that. So and and also suicide is a negative act, is seen as a negative act. It's not a fully completed negative killing karma, but it is a negative act. And as a result, he was saying there's a chance that he would take so that then you could see how a little girl gets cancer and okay. dies young yeah. like yeah. that is what they're saying. The same yeah. with the plane crash. But it's not random. There's created by all the beings in that plane have the karma to experience collective karma to experience the plane crash together. Some of them will die from the plane crash and have that karma ripening some will not some will be maybe terribly injured some may not be injured that much like that but it's okay. all those causes are in their individual mind streams and collectively somehow they're experiencing it together and it could be they're experiencing it together as a result for instance of them being in an army together inflicting harm on you know or shooting down a plane together in in an army situation in a previous situation okay yeah so okay. again the the correlations are not necessarily as direct as that but it could be something like that okay so in a way then you're saying to a certain degree in the world uh there in such situations there is no idea of randomness then everything is predetermined to a certain degree yes okay yeah, it's basically affected by a preceding cause. Everything, the, if the cause is there, then the situation will result. If the cause is not there, there won't be a result. Okay. It's as, it's as simple as that. I mean, it sounds kind of simple, but, you know, we know it's hard to fathom. And, and one, one thing I'll mention is, um, I'm trying to think regarding cause and, cause and result. Um, we have an idea on our planet and we'll say, oh my God, it was a miracle. You know, something happens and we do know people 
that survive cancer, extreme cancer, stage four cancers, where the Western medical tradition gave up on them and said, basically, you know, you've got three to six months. There's, mm -hmm. And then through their spiritual practice, um, they got rid of the cancer. You know, I do know a couple people this happened to. And they went back for all the medical tests and the Western doctor said, I don't, I don't know what you're doing, but keep doing it. Because so with, mm -hmm. with incredible faith, somebody doing Tonglin meditation supposedly cured their AIDS. And another man I met that had um, terminal cancer, very, very bad, did the spiritual practice that was instructed by a teacher um, religiously. He did it over and over and over. And then he had to still do things like every year. It got down to like he was doing it every day. Then it was every week, every month. And when the cancer went into remission, and then like three years later, the you know, the teacher said, you can just do do the puja now once a year, like you're okay. clear. And uh, so again, there there can be, and so we say it's a miracle, but no, if the cause is created for them and they purified enough of the negative karma, the situation changes like that. So I'm amazed that even in my own little mundane life, um, an example I give is um, even relationships between people, Years ago, I was running a center and, a, and another nun turned up at another center nearby. And I was kind of excited, never met her before, but I was happy to meet her. I had heard about her and I knew we had a connection to Laudo. And I, so, and, and then I finally met her and was introduced to her. And from the very beginning, she hated me. I, I had never met her before. I had never done a thing or said a word about her. She just, she was just so hostile and so, rude and it went on for like a year with she was interfering with our programs at the center she was i just it was amazing and i i realized like this is as hard as it was this is my mind you know i didn't want to own it i kept trying to blame her you know it's her it's her so i realized so what i did at one point is i um sincerely i got her a gift like but I, a really nice gift and then i met with her with a, a mediator there and I sincerely apologized because I had done something horrible to her at some point in, in another life. Like there was no question that it wasn't this life because I had never met her and and I, but I I really meant it. I really sincerely, and I said, what, whatever I've done to ever disturb your mind, I am, I am truly sorry. I am, and I really hope you'll forgive me, but I'm truly sorry for whatever. And I said it a few times and I just, that was all, I let it go. And she came to the, our center on retreat and, and by the end of the evening, she'd never had any nice thing. Just, she, she offered me a little thing of incense at the, like, at least there was this, she didn't really say anything about, you know, she just, but she, and then ever since then it got better and better and better. Now she's a good friend. She's like, it, it's so it's again, me dismantling the cause for it, which was in my mind, it's not external. It, cha it changes. I've done that many, many times. And it's so interesting that sometimes just a sincere apology just has such a sweeping effect on, especially meaning you really mean it, it can be really, really helpful. Yeah. Thank you. Anything else right now? Okay. Um, let's stop there for this evening because I'm sure um, it's just Friday, I don't know, you've been working all week, you're probably tired. I'm gonna stop there. We're gonna do some dedication prayers. Tomorrow we are gonna continue talking about how do we conduct ourselves? So avoiding the 10 non-virtues and talking about the 10 ethical guidelines, talking about how karma ripens, um, collective karma, throwing karma, um, completing karma, and um, how do you affect, you know, how do you have bigger karmas, lesser karmas, things like that. And um, so I look forward to if you can come back tomorrow, 10 a.m. Um, UK time. And we'll do a couple of sessions tomorrow, 10 to 12. And then we're going to take a break for an hour and then one to three. And if you're not able to come back, I did want to mention that I'm leading another pilgrimage to Laudo, April 30th to May 18th, 2023. We had to postpone a few years. But I led a pilgrimage in 2018 in October. Rinpoche has asked a few of us if we could bring people up to Laudo, do retreat. I've spent a lot of time there, so it's a really precious place. 
And um, I've led a lot of pilgrimages, but I've only led one other to Laudo. This might be the last one I do to Laudo. Um, it was one of the best things I've done in this life. Um, we all did retreat three days. We trek. We have a day in Kathmandu. I show you kind of my favorite haunts off the beaten track. Uh, we fly up. It might be the most exciting plane ride you've ever had. And um, we trek and then we visit some local areas and Rinpoche's sister lives at Laudo and um, it's just an incredible place to, to meditate. He has a holy cave there and we'll visit some of the areas around. There's a beautiful nunnery below Laudo and also try to visit Rinpoche's birthplace a couple hour walk away. So it's a fantastic trip. If you're interested, I'll just put my website in the chat and the information is there. You can contact the email and then we'll get you some information about it like that. And you can also find a lot of teachings and other things on that website if it's helpful to you. It's connected to a YouTube channel and that way you could get teachings that are categorized by topic if that's helpful like that. So you can probably look at a longer teaching on karma, things like that. So thank you so much for joining. Let me just share my screen and I'll just bring up some dedication prayers. So what's great to do in closing is to dedicate, we, we had a motivation in the beginning, let's dedicate whatever positive energy we've created from talking about karma tonight. It's great to talk about Buddhist philosophy. And may we plant those seeds of virtue from that merit into our mind stream that will help us become a Buddha quickly so we can benefit all living beings. And let's do these additional dedication prayers right now. We can just read together. May the precious Supreme Bodhicitta not yet born arise. May that arisen not decline, but increase more and more. May the precious view of emptiness not yet born arise. May that arisen not decline, but increase more and more. For the long life of His Holiness the Dalai Lama, in the land encircled by snow mountains, you are the source of all happiness and good. All powerful Chinresig Tenzin Gyatso, please remain until samsara ends. For Lama Zopa Rinpoche, you who uphold the subduer's moral way, who serve as the bountiful bearer of all, sustaining, preserving, and spreading Manjunath's victorious doctrine, who masterfully accomplish magnificent prayers honoring the three jewels, savior of myself and others, your disciples, please, please live long. Thank you very much. And if you can't make both sessions tomorrow, you're certainly welcome to come to one. And I hope to see you again. And please have a good evening. And think about, is it karma? Or is it free will? Thank you very much, uh, Amy, for these teachings. Uh, we've all enjoyed them thoroughly. And I hope that many of you can uh, join us again tomorrow to explore this further. Thank you all. Thank, Thank, you. Thank you so much. Okay. Have a good evening. Bye-bye. <laughs> right. Thank you.